Hi there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics, and today's topic will be a part two of my Just Cause Robotics Drive System Design Guide. The first part of this series was basically just talking about the first paragraph that I have in my design guide and dealing with calculators and calculations that are involved in determining your ideal gear ratio and what motor is powerful enough for a given robot, etc. Now I'll be talking about how to actually transmit that power to the wheels and how to actually mechanically achieve those reductions that you need to get the motor's RPM down to, or in some cases even up to, a speed that is more ideal for spinning the wheels of your robot to get it to go fast and still have pushing power. First off, we have direct drive, coupling a wheel directly to the output shaft, or maybe in some insect weights, the output can of a brushless motor. Um, it can also be just directly to the shaft of a brushed motor, of course. Basically, the idea is that you have no reduction and no mechanical uh, linkage between the wheel and the motor's shaft. You basically directly couple them together. First of all, there are very, very, very few cases in which this will work out properly for a reduction because you'd need to be really lucky to need a one-to-one -one reduction or something close to it. Uh, and second of all, um, generally speaking, you will end up with a system that is way, way, way too fast and with nowhere near enough torque. The only real exception to this is if you use a fairly oversized brushless motor, in which case you might be able to get away with just sticking like some sort of wheel to the can of the motor, but then you really want to support it on both sides and not have it cantilever it off the side of your robot, which I have seen some people do, um, because it will be incredibly fragile as with pretty much any direct drive setup, you will have an extraordinarily high weakness to any impacts on your wheels or the motor's the shafts will most likely break. Next up, we have belt or chain drive, which is generally the easiest way to get four wheel drive off of just two motors. And if you do it properly with the correct center to center distance between your sprockets and pulleys, you won't even need to tension your belts or chains. Timing belts and chains are often best for 12 pound and up because they won't slip, but round belts work great for smaller robots with lower torque. I was able to get away, of course, in Draconid's case with using a O-ring as a round belt on the uh, drive system out of that bot, even though it was 12 pounds, but keep in mind that it needed to be tensioned quite a lot to reduce the slip. and. Um, this is basically just down to the fact that you're relying entirely on friction when you use a V-belt or a round belt or a flat belt. Uh, whereas with chains and timing belts, you have toothed belts and chains, or tooth well, chains, you have toothed sprockets into a chain, um, which positively locks the two together. So you basically are guaranteed to have torque transfer if you have anywhere close to appropriate tensioning. Um, you can get away with a pretty loose setup with either one. But of course you get some efficiency losses if it's not properly tensioned in both cases of timing belts or chains. Um, using O-rings in place of welding your own polyurethane belts works great, but you can also buy polyurethane belting from McMaster super super cheap by the foot and then weld belts of any length yourself using just a soldering iron generally. I would recommend a very high wattage soldering iron. I actually got a soldering gun just for this purpose when I tried this out in my first version of Division. That was like a 100 or 120 watt iron where you pull a trigger and it heats up a big flat chisel tip so that you can melt the two ends until they're smoking and then join them. Uh, I also found out from Jonathan Schultz of HUGE that using a lighter to literally basically light the ends of the belt on fire and then shove them together and keep them together until it resolidifies, that tends to work very well as well. And I had issues with keeping my belts together so maybe the soldering iron method isn't the best. You can also buy, of course, belt welding kits, but they cost like $300, which is frankly absurd, and you can achieve the same result with just a lighter and then cutting off the flashing with an X-Acto knife after the fact. So really, why bother buying one of those kits? Um, another important note is that rubber belts lose significant tension over time. There's a chart that I'll probably pull up here that shows that basically within a few hours, you could lose more than 20% of the tension if you just leave the belt on for like a week, it could lose like 50% of its tension, but it, it asymptotically decays, so you're probably not gonna lose much more than that 50% of the initial tension. So if you're doing a quick repair in the pits and you throw a belt onto your robot, um, it will be fine for the next hour or however long the competition is probably, but do keep in mind that if you show up at the competition with belts that you put on your robot weeks prior when it was the last time that you tested it, um, they might be too loose once you get to the competition a couple weeks from then. Um, and may need to be replaced. Number three, planetary gearboxes. 
these are really expensive, but they're kind of the gold standard in a lot of the uh, 30 pounders and 12 pounders. Um, it's and also larger bots to some extent as well. You can get bigger and bigger gear boxes like P80s, etc. So like in even in overhaul, I believe there are a bunch of P80 gearboxes. But essentially, what you do is you buy an expensive gearbox and then you take your motor, you put whatever pinion gear that gearbox needs on the shaft of the motor. Then you find a way to secure the motor to the gearbox with some sort of mounting plate. And then you have a really nice, robust shaft on the output of the gearbox. You have an extremely high reduction in a fairly compact package through planetary gear reductions. And because you can stack the reductions, you can usually, or even just replace reductions within a single stage within a certain range, like on the, the Versa planetaries, you can buy the stages from three to one up to 10 to one per stage. So you could get a 100 to one gearbox that's two stage with a Versa planetary, or you could get a three to one to 10 to one that's a single stage and a little bit shorter and lighter weight. Um, however, the, being, the main downside to these is that they are extremely expensive. Uh, oftentimes you might be spending between, you know, 15 and uh, $30 for like a motor, especially brushed motors um, for your drive system, but you could easily be spending 50 to $90 per gearbox um, when you're getting these planetary gearboxes. Um, and I would generally recommend this only I would recommend only buying like these bigger like planetary gearboxes that like the P60s and the Versa planetaries or Versa lights for 12 pound and up robots. Though of course you see beetle weights often using planetary or spur gearboxes coupled to the motors that the motors come with for relatively cheap. And then people can swap brushless motors onto them oftentimes like you see with the 22 millimeter planetaries. That's like relatively affordable but still probably about $50 per side when you factor in the cost of the motors as well. Because I think the 22 millimeter gearboxes themselves, unless you're getting for them from a sketchy Chinese manufacturer, they probably cost still like $15 even for the beetle weight size. And then you're buying another like five to $20 motor to couple with that, depending on what you're using. So one of the other issues you might run into with planetary gearboxes is that at least in the case with like the P60s and the P80s, they're kind of meant to go with specific motors oftentimes. And that the same company sells that sells the gearboxes and same with the versa planetaries like they're meant to bolt to uh, first robotics cim motors or their Ver the vex pro 775s etc um i personally in my first 30 pound robot we used versa planetaries and we just bought Bainbots 775 motors and they bolt on the same way that um, vexes do they have the same bolt pattern so that works well but that's still a brushed motor of the same size so if you're trying to switch to brushless, you might need to be inventive and create your own adapter. Um, even 3D printing one out of like a carbon fiber nylon or something that's fairly rigid is probably fine though in most cases. And you could certainly get one laser cut out of just a plate of metal for pretty cheap on top of that. Gears, number four. You might be wondering why am I talking about gears separately from planetary gearboxes, even though the planetary gearboxes evolve gears? That's because I'm mostly referring not to gearboxes that you buy as a unit, but individual gears that you'd buy. Uh, it's pretty common to see individual gears used in like a, a larger reduction that's needed for like a hammer or a lifting arm or something, but less so in drive systems. But 3D printed gears I find are an extremely good option for a drive system where you don't need such extreme torque. Um, you can see that I use them in my 12 pounder Draconid. Uh, I've also been uh, throwing around the idea of trying to scale down to something that might fit into a beetle or an ant weight. And I know that SME, which is a beetle weight, uses 3D printed nylon gears in its drivetrain uh, with a motor driving a central gear that then drives both of the two uh, pairs of wheels on each side. Um, another interesting thing about gears is unlike with pulleys and belts and, or, and uh, sprockets and chains, when you're driving a gear, and then it's driving a gear next to it, the gear next to it is spinning the opposite direction. So if you're trying to do a four wheel drive system, you cannot have your motor driving one wheel and then gear it directly to the wheel next to it because then the two wheels will spin in opposite directions, which you could do with timing belts and chains, which is one of the nice advantages to them. You can directly drive one wheel or drive off of a, a planetary gearbox, for instance, as many people do, and then chain or belt to the second wheel and they'll spin the same way. But with gears, 
that doesn't work out. You'd have to drive a central gear and then have the other two wheels right next to it. And this is why it's more common to see timing belts and chains because you can space the wheels apart for a wider uh, drive base or longer drive base with the uh, chains and belts. But with the gears, you're forced to have your gear be smaller than your wheel. And that means that the tires are sticking out beyond the gear teeth. So you have very, very limited space to really put your motor or the other wheel if you're gonna try and do a four wheel drive that way. Um, but metal gears that are steel are extremely strong and more than ready to deliver extremely high torque for their size. Plastic gears, to a much lesser extent, can still deliver a decent amount of torque. Um, but honestly, I would tr trust chiming belts more because with a timing belt, you could have like half plus or minus a bit of the uh, teeth of the belt engaged at once. Whereas with gears, you only have like one or two teeth engaged at a time. So keep that in mind. If you're looking at a gear system, um, you have an extremely small area of the like actual root of the teeth of the gear that is dealing with all of the stress of transmitting torque there. Whereas with a timing belt or a chain and sprocket, you have like half of the teeth or however many teeth are like touching the chain at any given time, transmitting all that torque, which is why it's so much easier to get away with 3D printed timing belt than it is 3D printed gears. Uh, yeah, you also have to figure out exactly what the center to center distance should be, which can be tricky in some cases, but usually you can find some sort of online calculator that makes it pretty easy. And if you're using something like Fusion 360 to generate spur gears, I think that they come with like a dotted line that shows the exact center of the teeth that you just kind of make those tangent to each other with two mating gears and that tells you what the ideal center to center distance should be. Gears are somewhat tolerant to uh, center to center misalignment due to the shape of the gear teeth, but that's a mechanical engineering lesson for another day. Um, number five, combinations of the above. You could probably tell from what I've already said and shown you guys that it's actually somewhat unusual to see only one of these things used. Um, any time that there's a four-wheel drive robot, you will almost always see more than one of these used because driving a planetary gearbox and then having a belt or chain off of that is so common with a four-wheel drive system. Um, so feel free to get creative. I mean, there's no reason to stick with just one thing. Uh, if you can 3D print your gears and your pulleys, then why not use both? Um, you can 3D print sprockets too if you're inventive enough or just buy them because they're so low profile, they're so thin. Um, and still have quite high torque transfer because you're using a steel chain instead of just a, like a rubber or a Kevlar reinforced neoprene belt with the timing belts. Um, you can get away with a fairly th like thin system if you're using chains. Um, and then make sure that you have a larger reduction by maybe using like a super, super small pinion gear on your motor to a much larger gear elsewhere. Um, that's pretty common seeing just like a super, super small gear driving a really big gear for a relatively large like a five to one or so reduction from just two mechanical elements rather than having to buy a whole expensive gearbox and that's something that you can't usually get away with with uh, pulleys and sprockets because the minimum size is relatively restrictive there you're usually not going to be getting more than a, maybe a two to one or if you're lucky a three to one reduction from an individual pair of pulleys or sprockets, whereas with an individual pair of gears, you might be able to get away with more than that. Um, and through com combining multiple stages, in any of these cases, of course, you just multiply the effects. So if you have a two to one chain reduction after a one and a half to one uh, gear reduction, then you have 1.5 times two is a three to one overall reduction. And that stacks even further if you have more than just two uh, stages, etc., etc., ad infinitum. Lastly, for this section, number six, where to buy the mechanical components, I just wanted to basically show you can get the chain sprockets, gears, pulleys, wheels, and more at a bunch of suppliers. Um, there's links in the uh, document, which I'll have linked in the description here. Gearboxes that I mentioned are generally Bainbots or Versa Planetary from Vex, and you can find tons more from other sites that I'm less familiar with. And then wheels are available from tons of hobby stores, Amazon Fingertech, Robot Shop, et cetera, et cetera. And you can take a look on eBay, Banggood, or other Chinese retailers for some cheaper but more varied options, but your mileage may vary. Um, and you can also look at brushless motors on Amazon, Hobby King, Banggood, any drone or RC hobby store, really. And brushed motors will generally be from 
a lot of the sources I already listed or um, Service City has a really good selection especially and Banebots has a good selection that are meant to couple directly to the P60 and P80 line that they have. All right, next section here is pretty short. Just wanted to briefly touch on the topic of wheels. So a couple of rules to keep in mind with wheels. Number one, soft rubber is more grippy, but less durable. This kind of makes sense if you've ever actually seen examples of like a really soft silicone rubber. You can kind of pull it apart with your hands pretty easily. So it's a lot less durable than like a hard rubber that you see on like a car tire. Um, but it's a lot grippier because it deforms more so you get a greater surface area of contact patch with the ground. Two, foam tires are able to take direct hits without trashing your bot, unlike rubber. Uh, this is because when you hit rubber, it will tend to peel away a larger like chunk of rubber that's connected to it, whereas with foam, you can kind of cut through the foam. So you just take the chunk of foam that is the size of the weapon hitting it generally and not that much else. This is why you can often see robots fighting it out, where especially with a wedge versus a spinner. Uh, the spinner could end up going a full three minutes and then have like taken shitloads of chunks of foam out of the wedge's wheels, but the wedge is still able to more or less move around, because especially if it's a D2 kit, they're using these gigantic chunky foam tires. Um, three, custom silicone test tires are soft and grippy, and they can often perform the best just in terms of traction, but it requires a lot of experimentation, which means a lot of money and time. Maybe not a lot of money, but still a lot of time, and if you value your time, you could count that as a lot of money. Um, four, be sure to think about how to actually transmit torque to the wheels. Uh, with a live shaft setup, like with the geared motors and then going straight from that shaft to the wheel, you'll see with like the beetle weights and ant weights, you're usually using figure tech hubs um, that have a set screw onto a flat on the shaft or a D-shaped shaft. Then you have keyed hubs like the Banebots that will have a keyway on the or a keyway in the wheels hub and a key seat on the shaft that you would want to couple it to and then you'd buy key stock or pre-cut keys that are just a hardened steel like square rod basically. Uh, D or hex shafting can be used if you buy specially made D shaped bores or hex shaped bores for uh, your wheels and then you buy special hex shaped or D shaped shafts for the coupling so the Versa Planetary Gearboxes have a bunch of options for output shafts and one of them is like a hex which I used in my first 30 pound bot and then with the hex bore, or sorry my first 30 pounder we used keyed and then my second 30 pounder we used hex uh, for the drive system and we actually bought specialized hexagonal bore bearings from Vex as well to make that system easier. Um, and then for a dead shaft, because the axle doesn't spin, you're generally just going to have uh, bearings on your wheels, and then you're going to have to figure out a way to couple like a timing belt or gear or a sprocket to that wheel that has like a larger bore. Um, so for that, you're generally going to be want to you're, you're generally will bolt through like bolting the sprocket with some sort of bolt pattern to the wheel with a matching bolt pattern, or custom 3D print things that have a integrated wheel and uh, pulley teeth or gear teeth or what have you like I did with Draconid where you can see I have like a pulley that is also a gear and then I have a wheel that is also a pulley um, that are like a single part just to make it as strong as possible and you can press the bearings directly into that. All right that pretty much covers it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video feel free to like and subscribe for more content as possible. Bye.